Now, well, I'm going to read from Mark 1, then we'll get us all caught up to date about what's going on. We're going to read Mark 1, 40, verses 40 through 45. Please stand for the reading of the word again. A man with leprosy came to him, Jesus, and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. That's the word of the Lord. Please be seated. As we continue, we're finishing the book of Mark chapter 1 today. And I look back over about what we've covered so far just in the first chapter of Mark and understood once again why the gospel of Mark is considered a book of action. John the Baptist prepared the way for the king at the beginning, for King Jesus, then he baptized him. After that, he had to be tested as a worthy king and was whisked away into the desert to be tempted, tested for 40 days and 40 nights. After proving himself worthy, Jesus passed the test, then he began preaching. Do you remember what he preached? The time has come, the kingdom of God has come, has come near, repent and believe the good news. Then he called Peter, Andrew, James, and John to follow him, and they left everything to follow Jesus. And to prove his rule over the demonic realm, Jesus drove out an unclean spirit from a possessed man while in the synagogue. We covered that last week. And to prove he had power over sickness and disease, Jesus healed everyone who came to him and cast out even more demons, which brings us to this passage today. To continue at this ministry pace, what did Jesus have to do to gather his strength? Well, he went off to a solitary place. He said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. After he had his quiet time with the Lord, he got up and continued his ministry to preach the gospel. That is why I have come. Now, Jesus did all these miraculous signs and wonders to prove that he was the son of God and that what he preached was true. Now, a man comes to him with the worst disease of all. This next healing was different from all the rest. It was a precursor to what Jesus' true purpose was, to heal people from their sin. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this leprous man who approached Jesus was so desperate to be healed that he made this request at great risk. One didn't just approach a rabbi, of which Jesus was, especially if the person had a horrible disease. You didn't just go up to a rabbi and say, heal me. Now, to understand this passage and why it's so significant, you have to know a little bit about leprosy and Jewish law. Let me give you some background. The word used for leprosy covered any kind of creeping skin disease, both curable and incurable, ranging from psoriasis to ringworm. According to historian William Barclay, one type starts with an unaccountable lethargy and pain in the joints like I got from getting the shot for, for um, shingles. shingles. But then there's discolored patches on the skin. Well, wait a minute. That's kind you know, of... I have to get two shots. Look at that. Yeah, I got it in two months. I got to get another one. So the skin becomes thick and little nodules form in the folds of the cheek, nose, and forehead until the whole face is changed and the person loses their human appearance. They start to look like a lion or a satyr. A leper's voice gets hoarse and wheezy breathing and then becomes covered with a mass of oozing, ulcerating growths that give off a foul discharge. Next, the nerve trunks are affected and soon there is no pain where pain should be. Muscles waste away, tendons contract until hands start to look like claws. 
There's a progressive loss of fingers and toes until finally a whole hand or a foot drops off. This disease can last, or imagine, 20 or 30 years, and it's progressive. One man said to a leper, death would have been a sweet release. They had no health or strength, and to find food or shelter was a constant battle. They were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men. When diagnosed by a Jewish priest, the leper was banished from society. According to Jewish law in Leviticus 13, it says this, the person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Pretty horrendous, isn't it? Contact with a leper defiled the person who touched him. If he put his hand in a house, the house became unclean. A leper could not go into a temple or any walled city. If he did, he would get 40 lashes. You could not even greet a leper in an open space. One rabbinic teaching said, upwind, a leper can come within six feet of a person. Downwind, 150 feet. Put yourself in the shoes of these people. They couldn't worship. They had no contact. The only fellowship they had was with fellow lepers. Another rabbi said he would not eat an egg bought in a street where a leper passed by. Another bragged that he threw stones at them to keep them away. Still others hid themselves and ran away. A leper was totally isolated. Luke's version says that this man was full of leprosy. So he was as bad off as you could be. Combine this with a Jewish mindset that a leprous person was being punished for his sin and that it was a mark of God's displeasure, then you can understand why this man begged Jesus on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He had nothing to lose, didn't he? He had heard the rumors of what Jesus was doing, healing everybody. He did not care about Jewish law. He only cared about sitting, crawling, kneeling at the feet of Jesus. And despite all the Jewish laws that said he couldn't, he went through the crowd to get to Jesus. How many people were made unclean by this man as he ignored Jewish law? Matthew's version of this account uses a word that says he came to Jesus worshiping. Isn't that amazing? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. That is common view. They all see the same thing, but the reporting on it from different perspectives. Madeline, Nick, and Nick and Junior could see an auto accident, but when you reported it, you might report it different ways. You saw different aspects. That's how Matthew, Mark, and Luke report it. So Matthew says the leper doesn't just crawl to Jesus, doesn't just walk to Jesus. He's coming to Jesus worshiping. That's amazing, isn't it? He believed what was said about Jesus. Luke adds that he addresses him as Lord. What was Jesus's response? Jesus was indignant. Now, wait a minute. Why would Jesus be indignant? Most versions use the phrase, if you look at your version, it might say, filled with compassion. It's an interpretive choice for those who translated the original languages. But suffice it to say that Jesus was and is compassionate. Is he not? So why was he indignant? You might say that Jesus was P.O.'d as he confronted the forces of Satan, disease, death, and sin in this poor man. We look at the world, and aren't we indignant? When we see what's going on to this once God-fearing country founded on Christian principles, aren't you indignant about what we are losing and what we will lose? Look, we will lose it. The average time of a society is 250 years. And guess where we're coming up on? 250 years. So I'm indignant, but at the same time, we understand the people who are doing these horrible acts in our country are blind. They don't know. They're in it for the power. They're in it for the glory. They're in it for what they think is a better world. 
the money, any number, but they're all sinful reasons because the bottom line is they've all gotten away from Christ. Why am I going to the Fredericksburg Oktoberfest today? To preach the gospel because these are people blinded by Satan. So he's indignant because he's seeing what sin does to a person. Now, Dr. Paul Brand, the foremost expert in leprosy, or what we call today's Hansen's disease, discovered that it was a numbing effect that eliminates the warning system for pain in a leper. Sufferers bump into things, burn, and cut themselves without even knowing it. The limb or body part gets infected and drops off eventually. People literally wear out their limbs. Dr. Brand told of an account when he tried to open the door of a little storeroom, but the rusty lock was stuck shut. An undersized, malnourished 10-year-old approached him smiling. He's in India. Let me, Sahib, doctor. He offered and he reached for the key. The little kid did. With a jerk of his hand, he turned the key in the lock. Brand was dumbfounded. How could this weak little youngster turn the lock? His eyes caught a telltale clue. Was that a drop of blood on his hand? Upon examining the boy's fingers, Brand discovered the act of turning the key had gashed the finger open to the bone. Skin, fat, and joint were all exposed, yet the boy was completely unaware of it. To him, the sensation of cutting his finger to the bone was no different from picking up a stone or a coin in his pocket. The daily routine of life ground away at the leprosy patient's hands and feet because there was no warning system to alert him. That horrible? We say, you know, we when we're in pain, we say, God, take away the pain. And rightly so. No one likes pain. But pain is God's warning system to show us something's wrong. Um, um, Morgan deals with people all the time who are in pain. And your job as a nurse is to eliminate it, lessen it, right? Make it better. Um, I remember hearing Morgan say during COVID, how many people died that you knew of? Oh, 350. Uh, and also during Snowmageddon too, right? People would turn on their heaters that were gas powered, propane powered, and they would die in their homes. It's, so that's because there's a warning system with our heaters. If you have a monoxide, they didn't have that. Well, pain is God's monoxide monitor, if you will, to show us something is wrong. I woke up today in pain, or yesterday in pain all over. I, I, what did I do? I went to Google. What are the side effects of a shingle shot? I go, okay, all this is normal. I'm really tired though. Oh, that's one of the side effects. You're really tired. Okay, good, good. But that pain caused me to reflect, okay, what's wrong? Well, nothing is wrong. I don't understand how a vaccine works, but I don't want to get an even worse pain, right? So that's just like sin, isn't it? We sin a little, bit by bit, not really noticing that it's doing any harm. Kind of like the leper doesn't feel the pain. And then pretty soon, sin overtakes us completely. I talked to you about Dr. Stephen Lawson, who gave me the prophetic words a year ago that it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you leaving that other church. He was a man I greatly respected his teaching, solid expositor of God's word. And what happened? He had an inappropriate relationship with a 25-year-old who was not his wife. A man I would never expect. This is on the scale of Billy Graham. If Billy Graham had fallen like that, okay? And this just devastated me. But what happened? James 1, 15 and 16 says this. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by, away by their what? Evil, Evil desire. desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This man, Stephen Lawson, greatly respected, wrote 25 books, worked for the Master Seminary as a professor of theology and preaching, and he had his own ministry called One Passion Ministries, and he was the lead pastor at Trinity Bible Church in Dallas. Gone, and forever gone. 
He can never enter into ministry again. He can be part of the fellowship. He can serve, right? He can serve communion, do media. He can do, can't do. ever teach again. All over. All that he had prepared for. Gone. Gone. Because of sin. This is why Jesus was so indignant, knowing that sin had done this to this man. Jesus was indignant because of what sin does to a person spiritually separated one completely from God's love for eternity. Unless, unless God reaches out and touches us. Mark, you don't know it, but you were on the highway to hell. You should have played that for me on Monday. Okay, yes. But you didn't know that? You didn't know that? I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. Oh, your son has, I'm sure. And he said, nah, I'm good, right? I'm good. Well, you were ready to hear it last week and you were ready to be healed of your leprosy today. Amen. Isn't that amazing? You, you don't even know, you crossed, you don't know it yet. It's the reality of all this isn't gonna come to you for years. John texted me back, that's wonderful, Dad. Oh, that you got, did you text him? You got, you gave your life yeah. to the Lord? That's wonderful, Dad, he'll give you more. Praise God. Oh, he's probably doubting now. He's going, okay, what's up? What kind of church is he at? What do they tell him? Do they promise him health and wealth? No, I'm promising you this as a Christian. Yeah, I'm promising you this as a Christian. Disappointment, betrayal, suffering, hardship. Do you want to turn back? No. Because you have eternal life. Your sins are forgiven. When you die, and how old are you? 75. So you might have... 20 more years left, right? Maybe less, right? 50 at least. 50 yeah. at least. Either way, either way, either way. You're going to die, and then you're going to go to a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more disappointment. And that's it. You trade this life for Christ's life, and Christ gives you eternal life. That's the trade-off. No matter what happens here, I'm 65, so I may have 20 or 50 years. I don't want to live 50 years. I don't want to live 50 years. More. No, but I, I, want, I want 20. 20, and I want to preach as much as I can. I have that much time left to make a difference for Christ. But then I'm going to go meet Mark. Or you might meet me. I don't know who's going first, right? I'm in good health. I have low cholesterol. I'm in good shape. But I can get hit. I can get gored by a, by a, I can get kicked by a horse on the Shelton's property. We just don't know, right? Right? You can get hit by a drunk deer. A drunk deer, yeah. So we... We are separated from God's love completely until he reaches out and touches us. And today, Mark, God touched you. And that's just what Jesus did when the leprous man called out to him. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41 to 42, he reached out his hand, touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. This dead man walking was now alive, born again in his body. We too are healed when we come to Jesus in our leprous sinful condition, and in compassion, he reaches out his hand and heals us. Amen, Carlos? Amen. I'm going to read this. This is nine verses of Ephesians, but listen to this and meditate on it later. As for you, as for us, we were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Who is that spirit at work in us, those who are disobedient? What's his name? Satan. All of us, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, right? Before we were Christians, we just did whatever the... Leap you wanted. I was going to actually say it, but I thought, no, we're a mixed diet. Whatever the heck we wanted, right. right? We did whatever we wanted, except for Dave and Faye, of course. Like the rest, we were by nature. Listen, like the rest, we were nat by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You know who saved you, Mark? You made the decision, but you know who made the decision for you before you made that decision? No, God. No, 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 it's okay. No, God, God saves us. He grants us the faith to believe and even grants repentance. All we do is say yes. And we don't understand that what God's done in our lives until after we've been a Christian a while and study theology. It's all him. And God raised us up with Christ. Who did it? 
Who raised us up? Did we raise ourselves up? God. No, God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Here it is again. Say it with me. All of us read this together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He will in no way refuse all who come to him. We can't work at earning our salvation. All the stuff we do to earn God's favor are as filthy rags. That's what it says in Isaiah. That word for filthy rags is dirty menstrual cloths. That's pretty gross. All that we do to please God apart from Christ are like bloody menstrual cloths. Okay, that's pretty gross. But that just shows you if you try to earn God's favor, you can't do it. The only way you earn God's favor is by trusting in Jesus Christ. And he's the one who gives you the faith to believe. It's a gift of God, the gift of God. So this is why we pray and worship at the beginning. We are, we are praising and thanking God for the salvation he's given us and for giving us a hope and a purpose. Amen? Amen. That's why. We don't just do it just to sing songs. We're doing it, and I try to pick songs that glorify Jesus and God. You notice, it isn't about me. God, give me a Cadillac. Oh, Lord, give me a Mercedes Benz. My friends all have Porsches. I must make amends. That's Janis Joplin's faith, not mine, right? I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm thankful that he gave me a 2008 Buick. I love it. And a 2002 Suburban. <laughs> Praise God. Immediately the leper was healed. Immediately he was cleansed. When we come to Jesus humbly, desperately acknowledging our sin, he immediately heals us too. Amen. Granting us forgiveness immediately and saving us from the wrath to come immediately. Acts 2.21 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Everyone. God. Everyone. When Jesus touches us, we are healed spiritually. Demons are cast out. Satan flees. The power of darkness loses its power immediately. Verses 43 to 44. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. This man was not only healed, but he was now physically fit too. Why do I say that? because he had to go show himself to the priest in Jerusalem, which was about 60 to 70 miles away. The guy is healed. Now the guy is doing this and doing this and he'll by Jesus, right? Amazing, amazing. He hasn't even healed me that way. I gotta work out. I hate it. But then Jesus says this, don't tell anyone. Wait a minute, not tell anyone. Was this a test of obedience or what? If you were healed of, of Today would be it would be AIDS, possibly. I don't know what debilitated. I don't know what debil. What are, coming out of the gen, gen, transgender movement? That's a radical transformation, right? And not tell somebody that Jesus healed you. Oh my gosh! Wouldn't you be shouting it from the rooftops? Amen. Why would Jesus warn him not to tell anyone? Well, the Old Testament prescribes a way for a leper to be examined to see if he was indeed healed. He had to go to a priest. This showed that Jesus upheld the Jewish medical law and Jesus sent the ex-leper to the medical official. He wasn't trying to violate or go around. He wanted to do things properly. Jesus' plan was for the religious leaders to see who he really was because the religious leaders didn't believe in Jesus. But this man who was formerly a leper, he goes and is examined by the priest. They go, wait a minute, Jesus? Hmm. When they saw the man that the man was healed, heard the testimony from his family and friends, who he would undoubtedly bring along with him, right? He wouldn't be going alone. He'd bring in everyone who he's related to. This would be irrefutable proof that he had the power to heal. This would be a testimony against those religious leaders. In essence, Jesus is telling the man, when you tell them your story and they see that after all the necessary tests, you are truly healed from leprosy, then they are choosing to reject me and they're condemning themselves. But if they make the right connection and see what I have done, then they'll believe in me. They'll believe in Jesus. Last verse, verse 45. Instead, uh oh, Jesus tells them one thing, and then instead 
He went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So did the man pass the obedience test? No, no. He disobeyed, which may shed light on his true spiritual condition that perhaps Jesus really wasn't his Lord. Hmm. By his disobedience, he messed things up for Jesus' ministry. He wanted to start with the religious leaders, work his way out. Now everyone's going to come to Jesus. Why? To be healed spiritually or to be healed physically? To be healed physically. And that's just going to be a pain in the butt for Jesus because he came to heal people from the greatest disease, sin. Now he has to go around and heal people with canker sores, right? By his disobedience. He messed things up for Jesus' ministry. The priests didn't get their proof of Jesus' healing the man. And now the crowds made Jesus' outreach impossible. So let me ask you, what test of obedience has God called you to? If Jesus is your Lord, then you will say yes to whatever he has told you. You may struggle but ultimately, let him have his way. So on Wednesday, we'll talk. What has God called you? Think about that. What has God called you to do? Okay? I'll tell you right now. To love your wife as Christ loved the church. Amen? I'll tell you. Obey your fathers and mothers. Obey your father and mother. It will go well with you and you'll live long in the land. That's all I know right now. I don't know the rest of you, but I know those two. <laughs> That's just what scripture says, right? John 14 says this, if you love me, keep my commands. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Ah, that's pretty clear. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. That's Jesus who said that. Partial obedience is disobedience. May we as ex-spiritual lepers be so thankful for Jesus' compassion and healing that we do whatever he tells us and go wherever he sends us without hesitation. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace, your love that never fails. You are an incredible, awesome, powerful, wonderful God, and we love you. We want to serve you. Help us to say yes, Lord, to whatever you call us to do. And I want to commit this beautiful congregation to you and thank you again for Mark and his profession of faith as I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to take communion now.